So one of the core commitments in the come on in. One of the core commitments in our um, government's digital strategy and action plan is to adopt a, a digital service standard or a standard method to help agencies you guys to transform your service business. And transformation is tricky, and this is kind of the first time we've actually tried to do this sort of thing, digital transformation, which is why we felt it was really important up front to partner with the <coughs> Commonwealth Government, uh, who've got uh, some good runs on the board in this, to help inform what we do. The Commonwealth Government spent a couple of years, and Jackie has been leading that work, uh, to build a digital service standard to help the Commonwealth agencies to do exactly what we're trying to do here. And they're probably just a little bit in front of us uh, at the moment. So our, our approach was to align with the Commonwealth government rather than try and invent something separate and different. Um, but we have adopted the standard with a trial period of uh, ending in about March uh, next year. So we're looking uh, for you guys to try and use the standard. We're gonna learn a little bit about that uh, today from Jackie. Um, to a, uh, an exemplar uh, service of some description, and then to share with us and with each other how that's going so we can all learn about how to do this kind of digital transformation thing a little better. So with that in mind, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Jackie Van Elgen, who's the head of the Digital Service Standard in the Digital Transformation Agency, Wanting Digital Transformation Office, that has recently changed. Uh, Jackie is a, a very long-term uh, friend uh, of our office and also our government has helped us on a range of projects over the years. And Jackie's gonna help us to get our heads around how we might start to apply the digital service standard in our own context. So please welcome Jackie. Thank you, everybody. May I just ask who was with us earlier? Most of you. <laughs> well, I'm gonna just zippity do that through <coughs> some of the things. More importantly, who wasn't here earlier? Okay, so for those of you that were, I apologise because you're going to hear some of these things again, but maybe you'll walk away and be able to repeat them then until I've heard them twice. But for the new people that are just joining us for this session, I'm not going to come in and teach you this because it's really important that you get the fundamentals. So we've, uh, we just did an hour session with other people where we talked very much about the fundamentals underneath the digital service standard and how... Uh, they as leaders might start the transformation that the South Australian government is committed to. Um, in this session, I'm going to go through some of those things, not all of those things, but um, so if they're repetitive to you, I apologise, but we don't want the new people that are joining us now to miss out on any of this stuff. So I, um, I'm Jackie Van Fillion. I'm the head of the Digital Service Standard. My team is six. Um, we have a very big job. Uh, well, we've done a very big job already. We have a very big job ahead of us. Because uh, six people can't transform the entire Commonwealth government. Um, and in fact, we're not here to even transform the entire Commonwealth government. We're here to lead the transformation through the development and the rollout of a digital service standard that you as practitioners and people involved in digital transformation will actually be able to apply. So we're here in the truest sense of the word in the digital service standard team. We're here to support you to do the transformation. We'll be building the policy and the standards around how we might do that and some of the guides. But ultimately, we're here uh, to talk to you about these things. Who has been exposed to the service standard already in their role? Quite a few of you. Who considers themselves a practitioner? So somebody who is actually a practitioner involved in developing digital products and services already? A couple. So what do the rest of you do? Are you policy people? Are you business people? You're business owners? Who's a business owner? Who's a policy person? Okay, who's frontline staff? Who talks to users? Okay, if we ask that question in a year's time, we wanna see every hand stand up. I talk to users at least once, once every six weeks. We wanna see everybody be exposed to the users of the services. So I've got that, that poll is for my benefit, so I know what kind of people are in the audience. So um, I'm going to introduce you first to the Digital Transformation Office agency, and I will apologise because we just changed from a Digital Transformation Office to an agency in the last few weeks, 
and I'm using those words interchangeably. So if I say Digital Transformation Office, I mean agency, I just haven't got my head around the changes yet. If you see Digital Transformation Office written in these slides, we mean the Digital Transformation Agency. And what that means is that the government has taken a very big, big vote of confidence in the DTO um, in what we were able to deliver as the DTO in the last year and said, you know what, this is really what we want to happen at the centre of government and we take a very big vote of confidence and gave us more responsibility a few weeks ago. So we will have responsibility for all ICT policy and all ICT procurement. So at the centre of government in Commonwealth government in Canberra, that's six billion dollar spend we spend on ICT every year, and that responsibility will come into the DTA now in the Digital Transformation Agency. So the things that we've been able to do have really enabled that um, for the centre of government, and of course the Prime Minister thinks this is one of the very important things um, to help innovation, certainly within the government in the next few years. So I'm going to talk to you today about. Um, really about the service standard but before we talk about the service standard I want to just kind of give you a few ideas about why we're um, why we're actually here in the Digital Transformation Agency. So we know that people who use government services have no choice. They're not customers, they're users. They don't, they can't take their custom somewhere else. They bring their custom to us. They have to come and use our services either because they, they need them, they're going through some crisis or something, or they have to comply with something, or they need to pay a bill or whatever it is that they deserve. 55% of those people in power are problem, and we need to fix that. It's really not acceptable. If we tried to do this in a, in a private sector, we wouldn't have a business. If 55% of our customers had a problem, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in business. So we have a moral and an ethical obligation to fix that, um, to make our services simpler, clearer and faster, <coughs> and to do that for everybody. We collaborate with agencies in the DTO. This is our role. We can collaborate with agencies to help them transform their services. So this is what we're doing at the Commonwealth level. Um, we have a transformation hub in the Canberra office and another one in the Sydney office where we talk about, um, where we bring teams from agencies in and they come and do a project with us or a program, a product with us in 20 week time boxes and we help them transform that product. So, so far we've done things around citizenship, a citizenship booking service. We've done, um, we've simplified imports for a certain category of imports. We've done um, a hobby and business tool. We've transformed, uh, we have a whole series of people in Australia that we call makers. So those people who make doll's houses in their garage or lipstick in their kitchens and can't quite work out if they're a hobby or a business, we've transformed um, a service for them. Uh, we've done some, uh, transformed the way that you enroll your new baby into the Medicare system. And we've done some work around ACT health, but when you do have your new baby and you need to make appointments to bring that child in for um, health, checks, you know, the three, six week health checks and immunisations and all those kind of things, we've transformed those things. That's happening in our transformation hub in Canberra and Sydney. So we're working with agencies to collaborate with them and actually apply the digital service standard to products and change them within 20 weeks. In most government kind of scenarios, that's unheard of, but it is possible and we've proven that that's possible. The other thing that we do is um, in the D digital transformation agency is to create whole of government platforms. So um, not too dissimilar, we had a little giggle about this in the last in the last session that you know in the Commonwealth government we have you know 20 different platforms in 20 different agencies built in 20 different ways that all do the same kind of thing. And we know that it's not too dissimilar in other governments. We, we're sure that you, you can see examples of this here in the South Australian government. So we've been tasked with the role of building some platforms um, for whole of government at the centre of government whereby all Commonwealth Government will use the one platform. So we're doing something around GovAU, which is kind of like a one entry point. Um, we're doing an identity platform at the moment, like a federated identity platform, because identity seems to have been a vexed issue. D building digital identity seems to have been a vexed issue for, for a long time and never really solved the problem. So we're now solving that problem with a platform. We've done a digital marketplace, which is already available in public beta, and you can use the digital marketplace already. And um, we're working on, we're, we've built a cloud.gov platform, so any kind of cloud services that are being developed to support the um, new products that we're developing can go onto that cloud plat platform. And as we determine the need for more platforms, we will start developing them in the DTO for everybody to be able to use. 
And the final thing that we're doing in the Digital Transformation Agency is establishing the policies and the standards to help government transform its services and its products. And that's my role, that's where I come in, that's my team. We're responsible for the Digital Service Standard and that's what we came to talk to you about today. So, um, who, who has seen the Service Standard? Who knows where to go to find the Digital Service Standard? Okay, so for those that don't, you have a user-centred, what's your toolkit called? User-centred design toolkit on you... digital.sa.gov.au. So that, that's where you get to it, and that pipes you through to the DTA website, or you can go directly to the DTA website, dta.gov.au forward slash standard, and you can go directly to the service standard. Um, all of the products and things that we produce around the service standard you can download from that page. We have little um, sheets, I don't think I have one with me, but we have little um, print, you know, little posters which can print that we buy desk and big posters and Kanban boards and things like that. So any kind of products that we uh, produce that can help you uh, disseminate the service standard around the teams and the people who are using it, you can go and get from our website. So first of all, I want to start with um, talking about the scope of the service standard. Um, the government wanted us to adopt a more consistent approach, not a uniform approach to the way we do things, but more consistency. So we know that consistency matters because once we teach uh, a user a new skill, for example, once we roll out a booking system to a user and they know, right, I click here, I get my calendar, I get my time, and we've taught them a skill, we don't want them to have to fa be faced with another booking system on another website that works in a completely different way. So if we use consistent design patterns, and we have those design patterns and we're able to share them, then users have the skill, and they've learned the skill, and they have those skills, and they can apply them wherever they go. So um, that's what we mean when we talk about um, you know, consistent service design as opposed to uh, uniformity. But going back to the commitment, so th this matters at the, um, at the Commonwealth level, and I'm not sure what your commitment um, here is, except that you're trialing the service standard and you want people to give it a go. And you'd very much like to listen to how how you go with with your application of the digital service standard here. It'd be great to be able to case study some examples of the South Australian application. But certainly at the federal government, um, you know, we mandated that all PGPA Act um, Commonwealth non-corporate entities, so that's people that aren't Commonwealth business enterprises like Australia Post and things like that. So all government agencies have to use the digital service standard when they're developing and designing for public facing services. Um, we talk about services in three ways. We talk about high value, high volume services, low volume services and information services. And I'll come back and explain that to you in a minute. So. We, we have a lot of people come to our um, presentations about the digital service standard and kind of go, oh, right, well, good, I don't have to do that. And we kind of challenge those people and say, you might not have to do it, but why wouldn't you do it? Because, in fact, all it is is a set of principles that help you uh, apply best practice. So what we're seeing now is lots of the agencies who've come and said, oh, honey, we don't have to do that, are actually the best people because they're going, wow, this is really valuable. We're doing this. We can apply the service standard. So not sure what, what your plan is after you've done the South Australian trial, but ideally it's a best practice way to, uh, that you can use to apply to the redesign and redevelopment of any product or service that you're responsible for in South Australia. And I'd encourage you to use it. And I encourage you also to share back uh, what you find and how you found it and did it work or could we improve it because we're about improving it all the time as well. So we, we say at the Commonwealth level um, that you must apply the standard when a new service is developed. So any new service under development at the Commonwealth level must apply the digital service standard or when a service is being redesigned or refreshed or whatever is the reboot word that the agency uses. We say if, you're, if there's an opportunity for you, for you to apply the service standard in a refresh of that service, you absolutely should. But we don't have any expectation that agencies retrofit their services. It's not about going backwards, it's about going forward. So even for agencies who might be just doing a content refresh on um, you know, portions of their website, we say treat it as a product. It's a product, it's an information service, and you should apply the elements of the service standard that are, that are applicable to that kind of refresh. So, you know, make sure it's responsive design, speak in plain English, make sure that your users can comprehend the words that you're writing. So we say, you know, wherever there's an opportunity for you to apply the service standard, do it and do it pragmatically because it will help you. 
So I want to just clarify, when we talk about services at federal government, we talk about transactional services and information services. We classify a transactional service as something that results in a change to a record held by government. So if you're buying a product, paying for a licence, um, updating Medicare, a medical record, any kind of digital payment in or out, they're all things that result in a change to the records held by government about you or on your behalf. We call them transactional services. Um, a tax calculator or a wizard or a piece of stuff on a, on a, on a website that allows you to you know, put in information and get back information that doesn't result in a change in a record, those kind of wizard things are what we call information services. They're not considered transactional services because they don't change a record. We then talk about information services. So a website or a mobile application or whatever, we don't call them websites anymore. We call them products. They're information services. A website is just the delivery of information that you're providing for someone so that they can do something or be empowered to make a decision about something that we want them to do or that they need to comply with. So wizards, calculators, examples, decision support tools, they're all considered information services, not websites. Um, in, in, in our development of the service standard, we, um, we actually spent two years developing the digital service standard and most people think it's hysterically funny when I say we actually developed the service standard using our own process. So we used the service design and development process, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, to actually develop the service standard. So we went through a discovery period and we talked to about 1,200 people in um, Canberra and um, Commonwealth Public Servants who were practitioners who were responsible for providing products and services. And we talked to them and we said, how might we, what might be the best practices that we could adopt um, in Australia for a digital service standard? How could we use this? And we modelled from the UK government, so we were asked to model from the UK government, all contemporary governments, with contemporary Western governments who have embarked on a digital transformation have at their core, a series of standards or principles. So they have playbooks or standards or principles or whatever. We have them all. Um, so we started with the UK standard. We talked to about 1,200 people and um, worked out what the best things were. We started with 25 criteria. We moved it to 18. We moved it to 14. We moved it to 13. So we went through discovery and alpha and beta. And we had the uh, privilege of having your moniker with us when we iterated. You were with us for the final iteration, weren't you? So when we iterated the standard in the final time from beta uh, into its live phase and got um, Cabinet's endorsement for the standard to be applied, uh, Monica joined us and went through our, our very painful, you know, we argue about words, single words. Do we say by default as appropriate? You know, what do we do? We argue for hours about words and what that means and it changes the intonation and stuff. So very, very hard work. So the, the service standard is a result of about 350 hours of user research and lots and lots of people were involved in telling us um, you know, what they thought would be good and what they thought would be achievable and applicable here in an Australian context. So what we have now is the uh, digital service standard. It's 13 criteria that went live on the 6th of May. Um, and basically, um, they're really high level principles for, for great service design and delivery. Um, we, I've, I've told you where to go and find the standards. You can get these kinds of posters and stuff off the website. One of the things that we did to make it more comprehensible for people was to give these shortened forms, um, you know, understand what it means, you know, make it secure. But I encourage you not to just rely on the shortened form. If you look at criteria five and say make it secure, and you think, oh, five is just about security. It's not. It's about data and privacy and legal things. So don't just, we, we, we've used the shortened form to get so that people kind of understand these are things that I need to think about. But you need to read the whole criteria because there's so much more that sits underneath that whole criteria that you wouldn't want to miss. If you just focus on security, you might miss, you know, legislative things or privacy and, and the other things that relate to data. So I encourage you to go and look uh, underneath the short and form of the service standard. So big question for you, if you're a practitioner, if you're a policy person, if you're a business person, if you are in the chain somewhere of service delivery, then you probably need to know about the service standard and you probably need to think about, well, where can I start? What do I do? Unless you're actually in a service team about to embark on a new development or a refresh, you don't really get to apply the service standard. 
But it's really important that before you have to apply the service standard, you understand some of the fundamental principles. So I'm going to take you through some of those. And I apologise for the people who are in the room this morning because you'll have heard me say this already today. But I love this slide because it's my favourite. It's my favourite of all of them. So this is um, so this is how we traditionally work in government. Um, so we've been doing things this way for eons. This is the entire policy to delivery system. This is how it works. And what happens is that we formulate policy. So those people sitting around the room are going, yeah, yeah, I can get that. We formulate policy. Someone comes up with an idea about how we need to do something or how we might do something better or some new policy to meet a government commitment. Then we spend months and sometimes even years documenting those requirements and, you know, documents like this or like this or like this. In some cases, I've seen them. Then we make applications for funding. So we get money to buy stuff. Even if we already have that stuff, we buy more stuff. We buy more things that we don't even need sometimes. Or we develop things. And even though we might be developing something over here, we'll develop something new because we think we need to. And then we launch the thing, the policy, the service, and we um, send it out to users. And then we're smacked in the face by reality because the users can't use the product or the service was never going to be right for them because we never, ever um, talk to users in the first place. So this is a really high risk for certainty proposition and this is the way, certainly this is the way that we work at the Commonwealth level. And you know when we talk about writing requirements documents and spending money, we spend millions of dollars doing this stuff, buying stuff that we already have um, to, to make products and services that are never really going to work because at the, the, the reality at the end of this long time is that it's, it doesn't meet user needs. So the service standard asks you to change the way that you think about this stuff and change the way that you work and to work in what we call in, in, with a service design and delivery process that puts the user needs right at the beginning of the process. So even the policy process, if policy people actually talk to real users of their product or their service in the beginning, you might have a completely different outcome. So we say put user needs first actually spend some time in discovery, listening, learning and observing what real people are trying to do. And we say, go out there and look at users in the user context. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on. But if we spend that time actually understanding what people are trying to do in the context of their own lives, then we can design for them. We can try out lots of different prototypes to work out with those users in a co-creation kind of way, what works, what doesn't. This is called user-centered design. And then if we keep iterating on that and building and building more users and more units, by the time we get a product to the end and we can scale that product, we know that the product that we've made and the technology we've invested in and all the money that we've spent is actually going to work because we've delivered a product. And we can do that in 20 weeks, not geological time scale sometimes that it takes for us to do the, the whole policy cycle and funding and things like that. So this is the service design and, and delivery process in just a little bit of a different way. One of, the, one of the big warning signs I always say to people, if someone comes to you with a product design that has a solution in its title, it's already wrong. We do this extraordinarily well in government where we actually come with our preconceived ideas about what other people need and we design for our worldview, not theirs. So we say don't do it that way. If you do it in the way that we're suggesting and you spend time in discovery actually talking to users in their context, you'll design the right thing and you'll do it the right way because you'll be doing it with users all the way. So very, very important uh, concept that underpins the entire construct of the service standard. And when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll talk about the way we assure whether products or services are meeting the standard. This is the process, uh, this is the gated process that we use to make sure that products um, are doing the right thing. The other thing that underpins the service standard is a set of 10 design principles. Um, and they're really pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to read them all to you. You can find them as well with the service standard on our website. Um, but you can all start with the design principles today. You don't need to be applying um, or redeveloping a product or a service. You can actually take those design principles and you can start using them in your work and whatever it is that you're doing, you can use it today. So for example, if you, um, if you pick the uh, start with user needs in the next email that you have to write, and instead of writing four paragraphs of stuff, you write four points, 
you've thought about, well, who's the recipient of my email? They don't want to read a tome of information. They want to get quickly the four points that I need to tell them. And then suddenly you've started to transform things. You're doing less. You're making things simple. You're telling people only what they need to know, not all of the waffle words we tend to put around things. So you can actually do this today. In most of my presentations, I always challenge people to say, you can start your transformation today. And we worked out before that we've got six weeks till Christmas. So you could take two of these every week and in the next five weeks you can be transformed before Christmas. So you can start the transformation that the South Australian Government is committed to. You can do that in your work. Everything that you do, if you apply some of those principles, oh, I need to iterate this, I need to do this, I need to make it really simple for someone else and be consistent about what I'm doing, you, you will be on the path and you'll be changing other people. So what we're doing here is not really... Um, you know, a digital transformation, it's a mindset shift. It's a mindset transformation, the way that we think about things, because in government, we're too um, staid. You know, we wear the comfortable old jacket that we wore yesterday, and we think that that's going to be okay for tomorrow, but it's really not. So this helps you to change. And using those design principles is really, um, is really a way that you can put these things practically um, into practice from today. So when we talk about the service standard, we talk about the standard in themes. So the 13 criteria break down into four individual themes. And I'm not going to go into the detail of the 13 criteria because we need to do that across a day, not just two hours. But what I'm going to do is break down the themes for you. And um, so the themes first are your users. And then we say if you put your users first and you design around the users and you do it as simply as possible and in the most adaptive way possible, then you'll have a great service. So let me unpack the themes for you. So um, let's talk about users first. Who uses a government service? Everybody. We're all users. We drive on roads, we register our car, you know, we buy things, we use our Medicare services when we go to the doctor or whatever. We're all users of government services. Um, but we use them in the context of our own lives. We're kind of super users, if you like, because we're users of government services as recipients of those services, but we're also in the cog. We're also users and consumers of government services internal to government because we play a role in, in, in people's information. So we're also users of government services internally to government. We might be in the processing. So we are, we are users, we, we all use government services in the context of our own lives. And I want to talk for a minute about context, because this is the core to um, understanding our users. So what we want to do when we're in discovery is understand what is it that the user is trying to do in their context. So it, we, we research, we go out and we talk to users, and we talk to users in their kitchens. We talk to new mums in hospital. We talk to people standing in Medicare queues. So we go out, we talk to people standing in immigration queues or coming through airports. We ride trains with people. We talk to them about what they care about. So we do, we join them in their lives when they're interacting with government and we watch and we listen and we see what they're doing. And if we don't understand their context, then our service design is never going to meet their needs. And if we don't meet their needs, then we're going to um, create what we call failure demand. So this is Melissa. This is Melissa. She was a person that we talked to in one of our transformation services. And Melissa told us at the end of that slide, she just thinks that online is just too hard. So if we can't uh, design our, our online services and our information services to help people in the most efficient and effective way possible, what do they do? Opt out, call us up. So we, we call that failure demand. If Melissa can't get what she needs from us and we haven't provided a service that's simple enough, she's going to pick up the phone and she's going to call us. And that costs us a whole lot more money than Melissa being able to self-serve herself online and causes her a whole lot more confusion because she has to go, you know, call up, sit in a call queue or whatever. So we create failure demand by, by pushing those costs onto other channels. And that's not what we want to do. Another thing that we, we do in an NTO when we're talking about users is um, we're very focused on building empathy. So by using empathy, we can really design and build in real transformation. So some people have had experience of interviewing the people trying to use the service and then 
as a result, come back into the DTO going, oh my God, I had no idea it was that difficult. So for example, we um, transformed the citizenship booking service and we went and we talked to people in citizenship offices in Parramatta and Sydney and Melbourne and we actually sat with them in the queue for two hours waiting for them to get called to the counter, taking their ticket, called to the counter to do their uh, citizenship test. We sat in call centres listening in to the calls where people were trying to give help to make a booking to come in to do a call centre test. They sat on the call, they sat on call centre queues for nearly 90 minutes. And so we sat on those queues listening to their frustration, listening to the horrible music that someone in government decides people want to listen to. You know, we listen to all of that. And so we can feel their frustration. We build empathy for those people. And when we do that and we can bring empathy into our workplace, we can transform and we use empathy to tell stories about our users that change the view of our stakeholders. We all have higher people that we answer to and we learn in the DTO that empathy is probably the most important lever that you have in getting people to change their behaviour. So bringing user stories into the workplace and having visual walls, so these are, are real examples of work that we've done in the DTO. We go out and we, we do user personas. We learn about who Melissa is and what she wants to do and what she's trying to do in the context of the, of the interaction that she's having with government. So empathy walls are highly commendable to you. They're very, very powerful. Another very powerful thing that you can that you can do is learn to tell stories. So people look at me a bit strange and think, mm, that sounds like campfire, you know, kumbaya kind of stuff. But it's not. If you can learn to tell a story and you can use empathy and you can tell the story of an experience that your user is having when they're using your product, you will change the world. So if you're not good at storytelling, learn to tell stories, to tell other people's stories and talk about their experiences because it's the fastest way to change uh, people's view of what, what's going on because we bring our own worldviews, not other people's stories. Um, one of the other things that we do when we talk about users in the DTO is we bring um, behavioural artefacts. So people have um, all kinds of needs, all kinds of behaviours, and they go about things in some really bizarre ways that we just go, ooh, is that to do with X, Y, Z? It's quite bizarre. But until you actually go out there and look and listen, and you understand all the kind of diversity that we have in the people that we need to serve, um, you don't understand it. So we do things like this. We, we actually sit and, and really work out who the users of our service are in all their different shapes and sizes and colours and flavours. And we look at what the behavioural diversity is for those people. Some people are totally IT literate. Some people aren't, don't want a computer, don't want to know about it, want to come in and, and talk to you because you might be the only person that they talk to in a week. So you need to understand those things in order to be able to design your services around them. We also put in, we also think about lots of different scenarios. When we talk, talk about the behavioural and the cultural diversity of the people that we have to serve, we look at the kind of scenarios that they might come and be trying to interact with us. So this is really, really important. This example is relevant in Criteria 1 and Criteria 9 when we talk about accessibility and people's needs. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on, but we have a very low level of literacy in Australia, and yet we don't design for it. We talk above people's heads, so I'll come back to that a little bit later. But bringing that kind of um, behavioural and uh, diversity into your workplace means that accessibility and, and building things for everyone is at the core of your thinking all the time. If you have someone's face looking at you that is completely different from your behavioural context, then you'll think always about that person, about what that person might need in the way that you approach your own work. The other thing that we do um, in the DTO is make sure that we do lots and lots of user research and we track that. And we continue user research right throughout any product or service that we develop. So we don't just do the funky discovery stuff up front and go and talk to lots of people. We, we continue to bribe trains with them and we continue to do user research with them. We take our products back to them, we test them, we ask them, do they understand the prototype? Can you step us through this? Is it doesn't meet your needs? So it's a continual process. It doesn't just stop. We say in the DTO, we have a few little principles about this, and we say that uh, user research is a team sport and everyone participates. So we have a bit of a rule that everybody in the team does two hours of research every six weeks. 
and that's coders and developers and things like that. I see an extraordinary transformation of people when we take a, a DevOps person who's sitting there, you know, always with their head in a computer coding out to see a real user, how they're using things, they go, oh, but that's easy to fix. I can just do this, <coughs> X, Y, Z, change on a code, and the problem is fixed straight away because those people develop empathy with the people that are using their product. So it's really, really important to expose everybody in the team um, to this kind of um, to this kind of user research. Um, when you get to, uh, if, if you decide here that you're going to assure against the digital service standard, these are the things that we look for when we ask teams to show us that they're, they're applying the service standard. So, so our teams record how many interviews they've done, how many people they've spoken to, how many hours of research. That's why I could stand in front of you this morning and tell you we do 350 hours of research and talk to 1,200 people because we track it because it matters. What we do when we do that user research is um, is produce what we call user journey maps. Has anybody ever been involved in producing a user journey map? So a couple of people, a few people in the room, that's great. So what we do, this is what we call a lo-fi journey map. So when we go out and we talk to users, we come back in and we say, well, what were they trying to do? And we try and break down the story about what they were trying to do into phases, into stages, into activities. We, we try and work out whether they were happy or sad. Did they, were they frustrated with that? And we map it all out on a wall. We use lots of brown paper and sticky notes and lots of Sharpie pens and things like that. So sticky notes like sticky note heaven in your DPO. Um, and we map it all out on the wall. So this is the, um, I want to become a citizen. So this is the lo-fi journey. So we map it out and we said, well, what do they do? They inquire, they want to, um, you know, they, they, they make an investigation. How do I become a citizen? And they start to make bookings and they have to come in and do their citizen test. And by understanding their journey, we can understand what their pain points are. So we have about 300 and 330,000, no, 30,000 people a year want to become citizens, and about 28,000 of them have a problem. They need to make, they need to make a booking. Um, they need to come in and see the citizenship test. And what we were doing is we, you know, unforgivably make those people sit in, a, in an immigration office or sit on a call queue just to make a, an appointment to come and do the test. That's not even to do the test. That's just to make an appointment. So when we do user journey maps and we actually put quanti quantitative information around what the pain points are, we, we, we determine, wow, there's 30,000 people there who do this, 28,000 of them are sitting in a tip call <coughs> or, you know, up to 120 minutes. We can cost that. If we can remove that, we can bake that saving into the transformation that we've done. And that's how we start to focus on where the best transformations are by understanding what a user's journey uh, is through the system. So this next one is a similar kind of thing. This comes from having, uh, this, this is for a first time mum. So one of the services that we transformed in the DTO was uh, Medicare enrolments for the new mums who have to enrol their babies into Medicare. Uh, much to people's surprise, new mothers don't wake up in the morning and think, great, I'm going to Medicare today to enrol my child. It's just a nonsense. They don't think like that. It's just another thing they have to do. Understanding their context was really important for us to say, you know what, why do we make those people do that? We know what the baby's name is, we know when it was born, we know all of those details through other processes. Let's use that information there with consent um, to just automatically enrol those people, those new babies onto Medicare cards. So we did that. But we then used the research that we developed in the uh, Medicare program for an ACT health program. So this is a way that once you create research and you learn about a user's context, you can get lots of insights for that research. And when we followed the process of a, of a new family when they think about having a child and all of the government touch points that occur in deciding to have a child to the point of having a child and then living with a brand new baby, um, for first time mums, it's a frightening kind of thing <laughs> because you have no clue and you don't want to deal with all of these, all of these ridiculous government processes. So by, by understanding their context, we could map that out and then we use that same research to improve ACT health services. So that same research is being used now to transform a new service 
So that when that mum has her baby and has to make her appointment for the two months and the four month health check and immunisations, they can use the same booking system that we that we developed for the citizenship appointment service to book online at a time that's convenient for them to, to come in and have their appointment with their child. So here's a little bit of a way that we can actually reuse and be really smart about the things that we're doing, reusing the research and reusing uh, the things that we're developing. So that's a little bit about users and user-centred design uh, in the digital service standard. The second part of the service standard is around um, designing. And I'm going to go back to, um, to the service design and delivery process just for a minute. It kind of looks a little bit linear that we do this discovery, then we do alpha, then we do beta, then we you know put it out into life. But it's anything but linear. We do we continually build and improve on what we did before. So what we did yesterday, we're changing tomorrow because we know we've tested that with a user and they had difficulty. Um, so we prototype things and we try things out with real users. We don't just do it ourselves. We actually march right out there and if we've got something. To, to happen in the citizenship office, we take the prototype out to the citizenship office and we do it with real users who are trying to step through that thing. And we keep iterating and improving the product in a continuous cycle. So lots of the criteria in the service standard are there um, around adaptability and continuous improvement and using analytics to help improve things and make things better. We talk about, um, we talk about, um, user-centered design and we talk all, always about products and we say actually don't design the product, design for the experience because we don't sell widgets to people, we don't sell source um, and in fact you know when we look at, we use this image all the time as a way to say you know how many people use the source and turn the source bottle up and you know the source doesn't come out so they de develop tomato sauce, that's really good news but we all want to use it on something. So if you actually design for the experience, you design a sauce bottle that lives upside down that you can just, you know, push the sauce out and you don't have to wear it. So this is the same kind of, um, this is the same kind of thing that we were talking about. Design for the experience that you want people to have rather than just thinking about your product. Um, in the design phase is where we start talking about prototyping as well. So we start to prototype at the end of the discovery phase. So you kind of integrate the insights that you've learnt when you've gone to speak um, to, to reuse and interviews and you deal with the problems that you have and you come in and you say, how might we? You know, so we know that these are problems. We know where the pain points are because we've used the journey map and we come and we say, well, how might we um, resolve that problem? How might we address that issue? How might we? And we spend lots of time ideating to work out, you know, all the different ways that you might be able to solve those problems and then you start prototyping. So you might prototype questionnaires or um, you know, step through services or you might, might prototype for some kind of web app uh, to help the people step through what it is that you want them to do. And first of all, you start with paper prototypes. So we always say go mobile first because we know that people are using um, mobile technologies more than they're using anything else. So if you expect your product to be um, read on a mobile device, then prototype for a mobile device so people get the contents. Um, and we do things like this, like stick, stick paper screens over the top of mobile devices to understand how people might logically want to step through something. And then when, we, when you have enough information with the prototypes that you might make, you might make 90 prototypes and you throw them out, but you keep building and building and building, you move to um, prototyping in code. And so you can see there our Gave new prototype on a mobile phone in code. And so you keep building over and over and over and over the prototypes and testing them with real people until you get to what we call a minimum viable product. Um, and the minimum viable product is the minimum thing that you could put out there that meets somebody's need. And I'll come back to that a little bit, um, a little bit later on. So if we think about the current process, my favourite slide in the beginning, the policy for delivery, we don't even prototype. We just build something and throw it out at the end. We don't even prototype in many cases. And if we do, we might prototype and test with our own little internal cohort. We never talk to a real user about whether or not that product or service is going to work for them. So in the design, um, in the design uh, stage as well, when we're talking about designing in the first end of the service standard, we also think about um, service maps, designing and understanding the service maps. So you're not intended to read this slide. The idea of this slide is there are three services there and it's all the process flow 
the ins and outs, the end-to-end -end service of um, things. These, these are real services. They come from the Ministry of Justice in the UK. And the first one, the first kind of line you see is money claims. So think about um, when your neighbour chops down a tree that squashes your fence or your car or whatever, and you need to go and have a civil claim or whatever, have a money claim. That's the process that happens. That's the Ministry of Justice process that occurs um, in the UK. So you can see it's pretty complicated. There's stops and flows all over the place. You know, this piece of information goes here and it's tied to a record and all that kind of stuff is very complicated. Until you start to design and you understand the entire service map and you make a service map, what we found in government is just by making the service map of all the ins and outs of what happens in a service, we can see where the problems are. We can see duplication, du duplication in the process and we can see uh, what we're doing because generally we have we do things in silos. This, this team looks after this bit and this team looks after this bit. We, don't, we very rarely put it all together. So by making a service map, it helps us to understand what are all the processes that are going through, what are all the processing that we're doing as a government, and we overlay the user journey on the top of that to see, well, what is the user seeing of this, and therein we can start to see where the problems are. If we quantify this, then we can actually go, wow, and here's where we get our priority for transformation. So if we look at that, we go, it's almost always overwhelming. If you look at coming to transform the money claim process, it's kind of like, where do you even start? And unless you know where the problems are, it's very difficult to start and get a start. So we say, do this, transform in slices. Don't look at the entire thing end to end right at the beginning. Look at these kind of things and focus on the main pain points. Focus in the service map on the things that are causing the most problems or the things that really matter that will provide efficiency for you or efficiency for customers or people that are using your product. And we do a lot of that in the DTO. We try and talk to people about um, value streams. Has anybody ever done any value stream work? A few, yeah? Okay, so value streams is actually understanding where what, what are the drivers of cost and what are the drivers of benefits and actually seeing where in the process you can actually add most value and that you can calculate. So in um, when we uh, transformed the import service, so we, we looked at, um, uh, we, we transformed one, one import permit. One of the things that we were doing in government was requiring people who want to import endangered goods. So think about... Um, crocodile handbags and snakeskin shoes and like protected species. We, we, we transform the way that we import those things. We ask people who want to import those particular things. So, you know, they're, they're very expensive Prada handbags and things like that from endangered species, crocodile skins and stuff like that. We ask them to produce their permit 10 times and we ask them to fax it around. Uh, they were over laughing hysterically thinking, people just still use faxes? We asked them to fax it around 10 times and by the time we got the permit at the last fax, it was illegible, but we still wanted it. And it was just nonsense. So when we transformed by, by laying out the service map and understanding where all the processes were, the, we had no idea that we were even asking for that same permit to be produced 10 times because customs needs it. Um, agriculture needs it, quarantine needs it, you know, who, the import person, you know, FedEx or DHL or whatever need it. And until we actually went out there and we talked to those customs, we talked to DHL and we talked to FedEx, and you know what they told us? Our entire business is digital. So you go into a FedEx um, um, warehouse or a DHL warehouse, everything is widgets move everything. Uh, conveyor belts everywhere, RFID tags on everything. Everything is digital. No one touches the parcels. The only part of their business that isn't digital is the part that they deal with government. I mean, that's pretty shameful. And we could make it so much better. But until we lay out the service map, we don't even know this stuff. We actually don't even know that we have these problems. So really, really important to kind of pull together the service map. Um, not only understand the journey for the users, but the service map for the agency. What is it in your service that you're actually doing? And when you mesh the two together, you can really see the things that you need to um, focus on. And when you do the, when you do the service map, um, you understand very quickly what the minimum things are that you can do to make a difference. So this is what we call um, a minimum viable product. So I talked about this this morning. I'm going to show you a picture. I kind of tried to explain it to you. This is the picture 
So, you know, the first diagram kind of communicates the way we do things, you know, the A to B, how to get from A to B. So think about that groovy diagram, the policy to delivery system that takes eons. You know, that's eons. The first line is eons. That's the eons. We're going to spec every single little thing that goes into that car. And we get to the end and we realise that actually the person prefers to ride a motorbike. So the car is never going to do it. So when we talk about a, a minimum viable product, we say, you know, a skateboard is going to get the person from here to there. Then we can add some handlebars, might be a bit more comfortable. Then we can even add some, you know, bigger pitches. But we never take away functionality. We always build on it. So we need to think about what's the minimum thing that we can build and design and deliver that adds value for a user in the shortest possible time. And that's how we, that's how we um, transform. One of the other things that we talk about in design, in the design criteria around the service standard is open code. So we, um, it, it's, it's probably one of the most vexed I issues in government about open source code because we, we like to invent, at the Commonwealth level anyway, we like to invent a lot of beige tape around, you know, all these, we couldn't possibly make that open because it's secure and we'll breach and the whole system will come down because we put a little bit of code online. So we have lots and lots of beige tape and that exists, you know, for most people, because most people don't understand um, what they're doing and how code works and why it should be out there and all that kind of stuff. So we don't want to, um, we, we say in the service standard to make your source code open by default because we actually don't want to build the same thing 90 times. You know, we don't need 90 booking systems. We don't need 90 pieces of code with 90 different booking systems across government. So by doing things in open code um, and sharing them and putting them on GitHub and opening our code repositories, we enable other people to build upon the work that's done <coughs> before them. So if you need to build a service that has, um, you know, a booking service and it has an identity requirement and something else and something else, you should be able to go down the proverbial, take your shopping cart down the proverbial code shop and say, we need a booking service, we need this design, we want accordions for this, and you don't have to build it all. You just have to focus on bringing the design together because all of the code has been there and you can pick it up and you can build on it. So one of the things that we say um, in the service standard when we look at uh, criteria four is about, you know, to have a look at the tools and the systems and, the, and all of the bits that you need to build your service. And we say very particularly, adopt, adapt, or procure in that order. And the idea is that if there's code that's already available, someone's already done this before, adopt it first because that's cheaper. And then if you can't quite adopt it, then adapt it. Adopt what you can and, and make an adaptation <coughs> to share that back. And then only the final last resort is to procure something because we don't need 90 things, 90 different ways, and we don't need 90 of them. So that's what we talk about when we talk about COD. Code. At federal government, I'm not sure if it exists here in the in South Australia, but we think we're special little snowflakes. That no one and no one does this business anywhere else in the world. Well, in fact, there are lots and lots of governments, especially Western governments, who are all transforming, who are all doing the same kind of things that we're doing here. So what you're seeing there is our is the repos, is the repositories, the open code repositories um, from the US government. So every contemporary government has GitHub repositories where they've probably faced similar situations to what we've faced before and they've opened their code and it's there and available. So if you're a, a dev or some, somebody in the system happen to look at what kind of technology you can use, go and have a look at what other governments have done because I guarantee you will be able to pick some things up from other governments and be able to adopt and adapt them. We did it for the digital marketplace. We picked up the UK's code. We've done it for the booking system. We started with a prison booking system from the UK to build our booking system here and we added to it and we, adopt, we adopted theirs and then adapted it. So we're all doing it because it enables you to do things in a much faster way. So um, the citizenship booking calendar that we pulled in from the UK is now the booking system that's being used for the ACT exemplar service. And the citizenship process, so we did the citizenship booking service for the citizenship test. And we're now using that same booking mechanism for people once they've passed the test for them to book in and attend their citizenship ceremonies. Same thing. So you can see the value of being able to reuse this stuff. So the third criteria in the standard is um, built around simplicity. And so um, we do a lot of stuff in government that's unnecessarily complex. 
But we do a lot of stuff in government that is complex, extremely complex, that we need to make simpler. So you have to be careful. Doing things to make, doing the hard work to make things simple is exactly that, doing really hard work to make things simple. And I have an example here about content design, about simplicity in content design. So at our criteria six, we say, um, you know, to make things responsive and to use our style guides and our content guide. And our style guide says write in plain English. But we do anything but write in plain English in the government. So very few of us have been trained to write this way. And who, who in the room is a content designer or would consider themselves a content person? Do you write in plain English? You do, but it's really hard, isn't it? It's super difficult, super, super difficult to be concise and simple. So this is an example that comes from our, um, our hobby and business school. So we're the Department of Industry. We did a 20 week transformation project around trying to solve a problem for people who are what we call the makers. So, you know, retired gents who make dolls' houses in their garages or mums, you know, retired chefs who start a, you know, a jam business in their kitchen. Those people that do that making kind of stuff. Um, and they kind of live in this no man's land of not knowing whether they have a hobby or they have a business because businesses determine scale and turnover. So these people kind of exist in the middle, not quite sure if they're a business and not quite sure if they're a hobby. And therefore, there are uh, compliance issues from which they're not certain about. And if you don't comply, you know that you can be fined if you don't you know, do taxes and have a business and trade as a business, all that kind of stuff. So there, we found when we did research, this, this was a real issue. So we actually um, started to look at, at how we could design some content to help these people solve the problem. And we designed a wizard. So the, 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 service, was a, the service that we transformed was the development of a wizard because this is what our research told us. So we actually got some um, people in the team. So we got the tax ruling. Who, who's aware of tax rulings? So for every bit of tax that we have to pay, there's some big piece of tax ruling that says, says why. And the tax rulings are anything but comprehensible. Um, so on the left is the tax ruling. It's 930 words that explains, um, you know, the process for which you are to follow under the tax rule to determine whether you're a hobby or a business. Gobbledygook. Even the people in the team, the tax people in the team, had a hard time explaining what the tax ruling was in plain English. So 930 words. So then we asked the lawyers that were in the team to see if they could actually um, make it simpler so that we were still in the legalities of what we were telling people to do. So the legal people had a go and they got it down to 130 words, but it was still difficult. And then we actually got content designers in to say, right, well, how do we take that tax ruling and the legal stuff and actually simplify it and test it for a way that people comprehend? And we got it to 91 words set up in bullet points that stepped them through this kind of wizard. And this is working. So no one understood the tax ruling, and that's what we were serving to people on the tax website. Here's how you work out whether you're a hobby or a business, and everybody went, oh no, <coughs> shoot me now, I can't figure it out. Whereas now, you know, people people are working out whether they're whether they're in a hobby, whether they have a hobby or whether they're in a business. So this is a beautiful example of really good content design. Yes. What sort of time frame did that take? Oh, only a couple of weeks because we, it had to be tested. So every time, so, so I'm showing you a slide that says this is really simple, but every single prototype was tested. And every single word is one of those painstaking argue about the words. Yes, exactly. Because people, you have to test people's comprehension. So yeah, a couple of weeks, but lots of prototypes. In fact, it's a good point. I should put in the 50 prototypes that probably sat behind getting to there, because it wasn't simple, it was really hard. But that's what I say, do the hard work to make it simple. We all um, consume simple services, and when we do, we go, oh, gosh, that was easy. But we don't have that experience when it comes to government. Very rarely do I go to a government website and go, oh, gosh, that was easy. My latest example is trying to do my tax return last week before they closed off the My Tax thing. And I got all the way to the end of the MyGov process, then all the way to the end of the My Tax process to go, well, where do I put my deduction? I don't have very many deductions, but I do have deductions. And it's like, oh, well, no, I had to put them in the tax app. So at the end of the tax year, I learned that there's a tax app. And I should have had the tax app. And all year, I should have been going, I'm traveling from here to there. 
I have the tax app now. Has anybody seen this? It's my public service to you. <laughs> if you intend to claim a deduction and do my tax, you need the tax app. And on the tax app, you can, um, you can do all kinds of things, but you take photographs of your receipts on the tax app and it will automatically pre-prepare them for your tax thing. That's awesome. What a wonderful use of technology. But you told me at the end of the tax period. So you do this kind of silly stuff in government. Great app, but I didn't know about it. So I know about it for this year. So I'm now using the tax app and I've sold it to you all. <laughs> so if you want to claim a deduction, use the tax app and it's automatically <coughs> populating your tax return. But I didn't know about the tax app. So again, that's something that you need to learn from as well. So going back to the um, going back to simplicity and content and simplicity in design and make, doing the hard work to make things simple. The Plain English Foundation found that the APS rights at an average grade level of 15 or 16. That's postgraduate. That's a postgraduate level. Um, and more than 80% of Australians <coughs> actually even lack an undergraduate education. And 45% of Australians have a low level of literacy. So that's a year six reading level. So year six, top of primary school. So if you have to use, if you have to write, if you have to write any kind of content for a product or a service, you really, really, really <coughs> need to write and use plain English. What you're seeing on the screen here is a thing called the Hemingway app. Um, there are lots of apps out there that are online now. So the Hemingway app allows you to, to write a passage, clip it and paste it into the Hemingway app, and it will help you um, understand your own gobbledygook because we're really good at writing gobbledygook. So the Hemingway app, we use this in my team all the time. It's basic stuff for us. No one sends me any, any information to put into go anywhere unless they run it through the Hemingway app first. And when you do and you start using these tools, you go, oh wow, I had no idea that I wrote like that. It's a revelation. So there are lots of these kind of things. Everything that we develop in the DTO, we do using these kinds of things, not just Hemingway, there's lots of others, and you can look it up online. This is my, this is my personal favourite. But you can, um, you can find lots of those things. So being really simple in the way that you communicate is absolutely core to um, doing things well. And also simplicity comes around actually being clear about what we actually want people to do. To do. So here's a really, a really good non-example of being clear and really confusing for people. So a few years ago, the COAG governments, all governments of Australia, yours included, um, agreed that we would establish a national interpreter symbol. Does anybody know about the national interpreter symbol? So the symbol looks like that. It's a little blue box, two people talking to a person in the middle. And so we tell people, and we agreed to do this, all governments in the country agreed to do this, and we said, because we have such a multicultural um, diversity in the people that use our products, and a lot of people a lot of people don't understand written English but can hear spoken English. So lots of websites, I don't know if you've seen, are using text-to-speech tools now, so you can actually highlight the text and it will speak the website to you, because some people who are, who are illiterate they're just illiterate in the reading, not in, in, in hearing and in understanding. But some people don't even understand spoken English, so they need interpreting services. So we, in our wisdom, agreed to put up an interpreting service. We tell people about this on the immigration website. We tell people about this on the Department of Social <coughs> Service website. So I challenge you to go to those websites and find the national symbol for interpreting. So the idea is if you need help to interpret this information, that should be front and centre of a website or product summary and you should be able to click on it and get interpreting services. And I challenge you to go anywhere and find that symbol. So we're really confusing in what we tell people to do. We say we're, if you need interpreting help, look for the symbol. And I challenge you to all go and look for the symbol because we're terrible at really helping people understand what it is we want them to do. We're confusing. Um, next part of simplicity um, comes in at the end of the service standard where we talk about making sure that people can switch between channels without confusion and without repetition. So shamefully, this is a commercial example and they've done it stunningly well. Who's ever bought a house, rented a house? It's complex, is it not? Really, really complex. And typically, not everyone, but typically, most people will do all their searching for a home, where they want to live, where they want to rent, whatever they want to do, online, at home, sitting in front of a computer with a big screen and have a look and do those funky, you know, walk through the houses and all that kind of stuff. 
we look at insurance, we apply to our bank, we do all of those kind of things, we do that at home. We can put all our systems in, this is the domain um, website. Um, and then when we go out to the field and we want to look at, we want to be out in the field looking at open houses and stuff like that, they have got a stunning example of being able to move from system to system, you know, across channels um, and being, and they've designed their product and their service around the way people look for homes. So you can sit at home and you can do all that complex stuff on your computer, on your desktop, but then you can go out into the field and you can have your domain app and you can say, I'm here and I want to look at houses here and they can return that to you. And you can move on your account between those channels without repetition, without confusion. We need to do this kind of stuff in government. Irrespective of how someone wants to use our services, they must be responsive. They must be able to be used on any device. So this is a really, really good um, example of an organisation that has really understood their user journey, has been responsive in their design, and have designed around their users. A really, really good example. If we could do even half of that, we'd be doing really well. Um, also around the designing, as I said, I talked a little bit before about the platforms that we're building at the centre of government, so GovAU, an identity platform. We've got a digital marketplace out there now. Um, we've built a performance dashboard and we're building cloud.gov. So the idea is that if, you, if the services that you're designing and building need an identity uh, verification or proof of evidence or EOI or whatever it happens to be, you can plug that dash, that you can plug the identity system into your service. You don't have to go and build one again. So we're doing that at the centre of government and we will continue to do that with more platforms um, so that we avoid this, you know, 20 thing, 20 different platforms that all do the same thing. So that's part of designing and actually understanding what is out there that's already developed that you can pick up. Um, the next thing is um, about common solutions. So in my team, we're trying to keep a repository and a list of all the different common solutions that we're developing. So I talked a little bit about the booking system. Um, so the idea is that you should be able to come to a central repository somewhere and find all those things, like booking systems and things that have been developed, so that you don't have to do them again. So we're responsible for um, putting common solutions out there and keeping the repository of those kinds of things. Um, and you can find those on, the, on our website under a guide called Common Solutions. Um, the final part of the service standard is around adaptability. And um, when we talk about adaptability, this is, this is where the things like a multidisciplinary team comes in. So in criteria two in the service standard, we say have a multidisciplinary team. And the reason that we do that is that um, we, we, we're currently siloed in the way that we think and in the way we design and deliver and develop things, we're siloed. So I'm not sure how it happens in the departments that you come from, but we see it in federal government all the time. The user-centered design people sit here, the business people sit here, the policy people are here, IT's over here, and you know, performance accounting is somewhere else. And we're actually saying, that's the wrong way to do things. You need to take a slice of all of those people and put them in one team in a multidisciplinary team where they can work together to solve the problems, to understand what the user need is, um, you know, go through ideation about how we might solve the problems, because then you're getting experts from every, they're coming with knowledge about their own expertise, putting them together to produce something. So in the DTO we say um, about two, piece, two pieces, so 10 to 12 people in the team, and what you can do to transform a service in 20 weeks with just 10 to 12 people, but they have to be from every discipline. With decision-making capability in the team, not this nonsense of 50 levels of hierarchy and rubber stamps all over the place. The team has to be empowered to make decisions um, and not have to you know, write requirements, documents that become the stairway to heaven. If we bring those people together in a multidisciplinary team, we can create quite magical services very, very quickly. We're seeing this in the DTO, and we see this with people working in an agile way. And any time we ask somebody once they've had an experience of working in that way, would they go back? The answer is definitely no. Monica, you had an experience of working in this way with us in the DTO, and how did you like it? Would you want to go back? I think both teams are all converted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, look, in, a, in a 13 or 14 years or whatever that I've been in government, I've learnt most in the last two years since I've been in the DTO and I've learnt most by working in this way. 
So in my team, there's not a single person in my team who can do the same job as another person in my team. So we say the unit of delivery is the team. We're not one out. If I'm not there to lead, or someone's not there to do the content, or someone's not there to, to push things to publish or whatever, um, a few of us can do different things, so we shadow with each other and we learn each other's job, but it's all of us all in every day. We all contribute and there's no hierarchy. We're one, we sit at one table around one circle and we all contribute, we all play. Um, and once you work like this, once you work in a team like that, um, you, you establish incredible trust and you, you really see very quickly the strengths and weaknesses in people and the way that we also work in the you know, using Agile as the principles is we have some team principles and we have ceremonies. So we have a stand up every morning, just a 15 minute, two minute update from everybody, what they did yesterday, what they're doing today. And every single week in our team, we have a retrospective and we say, this worked really well. This didn't work really well. Here's what puzzles us, like we kind of haven't figured this out yet. And here's what we, here are the actions that we're going to take um, to make that different next week. And it takes a whole lot of trust to go, oh, gee, you know, I really didn't like the way you said that or you did that or whatever. We do that every single week. And, and the things that we like, we do more of. And the things that we lack, we do less of. And we do that every single week. We have awkward conversations about what worked and what didn't. And we iterate the way we work every single week. And it's incredible. You have a really, really uh, highly cohesive, highly productive team. And we're able to produce things that I would never have been able to produce anywhere else when everybody sat at desks with their backs to each other. <coughs> we talk to each other all day, every day. And even when we're not here, we're talking to each other through things like Skype and Link and things like that. So it's part of working in this new way. All the people in the team from the beginning can build the product together and they can do it much faster. So when we talk about product teams, we kind of say as you go through um, as you go through the service design and delivery process, your team <coughs> will change a little bit. So um, all the roles are important in the team, but as you we, we kind of go through this process of expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting, depending on what your team, um, what your product or your service is. So we kind of say in discovery, you probably have a few more user researchers and service designers. And when you get to bigger, you probably have more dev and DevOps and people, you know, coding and, and um, testing things. So your team will change. Um, and the idea is that this isn't, this isn't written in stone. Only you know your product and your service and only you know the right level of people that should be in your team. So, for example, in that hobby and business tool team, we had a tax lawyer or we had a tax expert and we had a lawyer. You wouldn't normally have a lawyer in your team, but they're the subject matter experts. So they come in and out of the team to help guide the team and make sure that the solutions the team is delivering actually are going to meet the legislation or the law or whatever it happens to be. Everyone in the team is a doer. No person in the team can do it on their own. They're all contributors. Um, one of the ways that we kind of share things, I don't know if I said this here or in the last session, is um, by pairing and um, spooning, sometimes we call it, and shadowing. So where someone in the team has expertise that someone else doesn't have, we ask them to work together and shadow each other so that one person shadows that person's job for a few days until they actually have learnt you know, the key things that that person does. Um, and it's really important because it helps upskill you, upskill your own skills. A few years ago, I couldn't code, and now I'm learning to code because the most junior member in my team is teaching me. I'm kind of boring as hell, but you know, at least I can do it. You know, at least I can kind of do it. And I understand now when someone says to me, oh, but we can't change that. It's like, well, I can't change it. Let's do this. I get it now. So I'm really building empathy even with the people in my team. It's really good. Um, so the other thing about adaptability is also making sure that you're continuing that improvement, continuing the user research, that you're actually out there continually observing and listening to the users of your product because only by doing that will you actually be able to improve. So I said before, remember, two hours of research per person every six weeks. So in my team, we've just finished about, oh, we've probably just done about 60 more hours of research because we've been talking to people who are out there assessing services against the service standards. So we went to actually understand what the assessment process was like and how people were finding it and could we make it better. 
Um, so we, we do that all the, all the time. We keep talking to people. We keep um, every prototype, every product that we put out there, we keep um, testing it with users, making sure that users are able to use it, and if they can't, why can't they? Which brings me into the um, continuous kind of user <coughs> testing. So what you're looking at here is an artifact from our wall. All the, or all the pink sticky notes are accessibility issues. So once we started to put things in code online and actually start testing them with people, we found that we were having lots of usability issues. And so by understanding what those issues are, every single one of those pink notes goes into a fix it into our backlog. So we use it, work on a process of user stories as a user, I want to be able to do X, Y, Z, and I can't because that orange or pink sticky note is preventing me from doing that. So we take those notes and we say, right, we need to fix this, and they go into our production crew, our, our production backlog, and we fix those things as we find them. And that's what we mean by um, continual in improvement. So every day we're releasing new, new things into the product because we're improving what we're doing. And the other part of adaptability is making sure that you understand all the analytics and all the information that's available to you um, from wherever it's coming. So in the service standard, we say you must measure four KPIs. So that's user satisfaction, completion rate, digital take up and cost. Um, and that you should report those on the dashboard. And I'll come to the dashboard in a second. But they're not the only four things that you should measure when you have a service. If you've got an information service, you probably want to want to care about where people come in where they enter your page and where they exit and you probably want to look at bounce rates and you probably want to look at numbers of people and you know if you're providing a link for them to do an action how many people complete and do that action so depending on what your product or service is you would be measuring these four kpis plus you'll be measuring um, lots of other things that are, that help determine the success uh, for your product this is an example of the performance dashboard that we've built built at the dto so um, for every product that goes through to the beta phase, once you're in the beta phase, you don't pass through to the beta phase until you have a performance dashboard. So we're being open and transparent about what we're um, about every single service. We're saying these are the metrics that um, help ensure that this service meets its users' needs. Here's the user satisfaction. Here's the cost for producing that service. And you'll see on this dashboard that we don't have any cost data in there because cost per transaction is not something that the Commonwealth Government is measuring at the moment. But we've got it there because it matters. We would not have jobs if we thought in the, in the private sector that we could build services without any recognition of how much it costs for them to build. So it's something that we're pushing the Commonwealth Government very hard to understand what are the things that make up the cost for their product or their service and actually be able to report them transparently so we want to know over time, you know, if one agency can develop um, a service that costs $1.33 per transaction and it costs someone else $133, we need to understand why, you know, what, what is it about that, what, what's going on with that product that makes it different. The other thing that I encourage you to have a look at is um, when we talk about measuring user satisfaction, we, um, we think... Um, measuring user satisfaction in, in a one dimension, i.e. serve somebody a five point questionnaire or we're happy or sad at the end of the transaction is not really useful. Um, especially if you work in um, an eligibility space. So for example, if you're the Department of Human Services and somebody has applied for um, eligibility for a benefit and they get to the end of the process and are told no, they're not eligible for the benefit, and then you ask them, am I satisfied with the service? They're never going to be satisfied with the service. There's nothing to do with the service and everything to do with not getting the benefit. So we think that the measuring user satisfaction in, in one dimension it, is, has a limited life. And so we've been experimenting with the Google Heart Framework in the DTO, and the Google Heart Framework actually measures satisfaction in, in, in five different elements. So we, we're playing with this at the moment. I, I'm not sure um, whether it's totally applicable in a government environment, but it's certainly much better. Measuring user satisfaction in a multi-dimensional way rather than a single dimension is much better indication of user satisfaction. But depending on your product or your service, you might find other ways to measure user satisfaction. And if you do, we really want to hear about them because this is something that we're, we're struggling with at the moment. We're just testing this. Um, 
we've never done this before at the centre of government on a per product basis. We've kind of gone surveys and you know done um, you know kind of qualitative surveys about what people think of government services, but we actually want to know what people think of that government service when they're receiving it. So if you um, if you get to experiment with this kind of stuff in the work that you do, we really be keen to hear from you. Um, another part about the adaptability is making sure that we're listening to all the analytics and all the processes and stuff like that that you um, that you're able to um, be informed by to help the data improve your service. No one can argue with data. We actually get a lot of um, again beige tape at Commonwealth level where Commonwealth public servants make up rules that simply don't exist to justify a position that they want to push. So I say all the time, actually, have the data, have the evidence. No one can argue with evidence. No one can argue with data that you put on the table. If you say, you know, we've taken 14,000 pages of information off a website and moved it to 28, and it's better because people are going, you know, people are actually comprehending what we want to do, no one's going to believe you. Have the data to show and have the comprehensive scores at the end of it to show that this is what you've been able to achieve. So, um, I'm not sure that I'm going to spend a lot of time on meeting on meeting this. I'm just going to whiz through this very quickly. But in the Commonwealth Government, we we actually say um, we actually measure all services against the service standards. So no service is allowed to go live unless they pass um, our assessment. And and we have assessments. We assess services at three points through the service design and delivery process. So we assess them at the end of alpha. We assess them during the middle of beta, and then we assess them again before they go live. And the purpose of that is actually to make sure that we don't put any product out there to the public that doesn't meet their needs, that can't demonstrably meet um, user needs and you know that all systems are working and it's safe and secure and all that kind of stuff. So this is the way we do it at, at federal level. At Alpha, we, we're looking for the service must demonstrate that they pass the first three criteria and then at beta and live they have to pass all criteria. And um, we help teams to track against the service standards. So on our pages, on our website, there's a whole lot of information about what you need to do to show that you're meeting the service standard and that's all there. You can go and have a look at that. We provide um, these Kanban boards, these tracking boards. So if you're in a service team and about to apply the digital service standard, you can go and print some of these off. So they're big AO posters and they help you to track the kind of things that you're doing in applying the digital service standard and actually help you collect all the artifacts that help to for you to demonstrate that you're applying the service standard. So in the DTO we have this thing called show the thing. So assessment principles are doing doesn't equal done. We don't want to hear plans about plans because that's just waffle. We actually say show me the thing. Show me what you've built. Show me the prototype. Show me the user using the product. And we, you know, we video these things and we photograph these things. And so when it comes to service assessment, where we're looking at assessing products and services, we look to see the artifacts. And so we put all these tools together so that teams themselves can help track how they're going against the service standard, all the artifacts that they're building and developing um, against the service standard, so that when we come for an assessment, we sit down with them and we have a big discussion about what they've done and are they ready and are they meeting the service standard, and then we either pass or not pass them against the standard. So that's what we do at, um, at federal level. Um, I've got a couple more slides for you. One is about where to go for guidance. So um, on our service, on our standard, um, pages on our website. We have these um, clickable, the short heading links are all clickable and if you click through to those short heading links you will find underneath the things that we look for at each criteria. So in criteria one at alpha you must be able to show these things. At beta you must be able to show the next level of things. You can find all those things on our website. We also have um, down the bottom of the standards page this uh, tool, so all of the tools that we ever produce for the service standard are all there. You can just hop in there and you know, pull anything down or print it off. Um, always check the date at the bottom from the previous one you've got to see whether or not it's been updated. And of course we have a whole lot of guides on the website as well. So if you need information about creating APIs or doing some of this stuff, we've got guides. 
and you've got your own great service design filter here that Monica and her team or whoever's put that together for you. Um, and I know that lots of that links through to our stuff as well. So this is a great example of South Australian government building in upon what, what we started with. And of course, we, we now look at that and go, oh, let's have some of that and we share it back because that's the way that's the way we do things. So um, this is really a slide for the Commonwealth Government. One of the things that, that we do is um, have lots of communities and it would be great to see, um, you know, in the way that you go forward here and to establish a service design or a digital government community here, um, you will learn more from each other than you will ever learn from me. And you'll learn more by talking and coming together and talking about your experiences and sharing your failures. What didn't work and why didn't it work? And it's really good to have those kind of conversations and work together in a community to learn from each other. So that's enough for me. I've got, um, how long have we got now? 15 minutes or so, 20? 20 minutes, For questions. Great, well, I think we'll start off with a quick round of applause to thank you. At, um, at federal government level is when we've transformed these services that um, it's really hard user recruitment. Recruiting users to talk to is really, really difficult. And, and finding people with special needs or special you know, diversity um, is, is quite difficult. Um, and we did some work around the um, LGBTI, is that Yes, <laughs> I always mess that acronym up. Um, we did some work around that and it was really hard to find those people, but they, they just thought it was great when we came to talk to them about their experiences. So where you have um, that available to you, that's gold. So we, I'd like to come back to you and um, hook our people in with that. Because when we talk to users, we don't talk to users just in Canberra. We go all over the place. Your users are our users too. What challenges have you had in that sort of space and uh, did the DTOA um, do some recruitment to try to get some of the skills in house? I mean, in here in this government, we've done a lot of, we outsource a lot of our like coding now because it's software as a service. And so there's probably some of the skill sets that we don't have anymore. So did the DTO, DTA have, do you have some experience you could share in that space? Yes, I do, and you're absolutely spot on. It's really, really hard to find people with these kind of skills. People who work in agile teams, who have all of the, you know, or in the different streams, all of those expertise and skill sets. We've had a, a, a really difficult time in the DTO getting people with that expertise. Um, there's lots of generalists, but there's very few expert specialists out there. And you may not have been in the last session, but one of the things I spoke about in the last session for the leaders that were in the room is to make sure that when you're bringing in contractors and stuff, that you're not upskilling contractors who are going to sell work back to you. So we say in the DTO that when you bring people in, when you bring contractors in, make a part of their contract to be skill transfer to your staff. Because one of the things that hampers us, certainly in Canberra, and the APSC found this, that our level of digital skill is not there. So, and we need to develop it rather than continue to upskill contractors who just contract back to us at five times the price that we all, all get paid. I mean, we all chose to be public servants because we chose to serve the public, and we keep upskilling these other people. So, we talk about um, 
We talk about caring and shadowing with people, and that's what we mean. Ex experts are expensive, so when you pay one, make sure you get your value from that person and make sure that that person leaves having transferred some skills to your team. And you learn by doing, you know, and you learn so much by doing. And also, if you get to one day do assessing, you learn a lot by having a window into another service if you're the assessor of another service. But yes, it's a, it's, it's a critical issue for us. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why we're focusing a lot on a capability building strategy and communities. Because people like to come together to be able to talk about, um, you know, things and share their problems and help them be solved. So, yeah, it is an issue. So, um, if you weren't with me this morning and you Google the Atlassian spooning video, you get a pretty good idea about what I'm talking about, about getting experts in to share and help care with other people to share their skills. I should just say, sorry, um, I should just say our digital marketplace, so we have a product out already called the Digital Marketplace, where we have um, done a panel of experts like this, so we've actually gone on the digital marketplace and said these are the skills that we need, these are the roles that we need in government, agile coaches, coders, developers, um, you know, user experience designers, all that kind of content designers, all that kind of stuff, and all the job descriptions for what that person should be able to do are all available to you on the digital marketplace. We also have guides on our product on our pages around the team, the digital team, about what skills you should be looking for to be, you know, considered one of those people. And you can go onto the digital marketplace and put a brief on there and say we need this kind of expert to do this kind of job to and, and, and be served all of these things. So it's a really fast way to get those skills in an agile environment as well. But there's lots of great info on there around skills and, and what, what those particular roles really do. So if, if some of you in the room um, fit into those roles, you should go and have a look at those skills and go, well, what, do I have all those skills or don't I? And if I don't, you know, take your own pathway to developing more of those skills because we know at federal level that we don't have a lot of those skills. Thank you. So many questions. Um, thanks for the heads up about the tax app too. The most useful piece of information ever. Um, well, but useful at the beginning of a tax cycle, not the end. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I just wondered, Jackie, whether um, there was somewhere or thought being given to somewhere being developed for um, people to put their it's broken stories um, rather than have to sort of complain back through departments and go through departmental complaints processes, which often kind of, you know, that kind of seems to get buried and not that, you know, individuals get things resolved but they're not necessarily tackled at a systemic level. Um, is there some sort of thought um, that's been given to where people could lodge their um, systemic sort of issues um, so that someone else can pick them up and elevate them? That's a really good question. We've, um, I've been the author of several briefs over the last few years to do exactly that. Um, <coughs> uh, based off, again, a model in the UK where they had a um, service called Fix My Street, you know, developed in local government. Um, and I think it's a fabulous idea. And if you do it, please tell us. <laughs> because I think it's a fantastic idea and, and you know we've toyed we've toyed you know at the policy level about doing something like that for Commonwealth government for quite a long time but um, there's a, it's probably a double-edged sword I think there's something like that sorely needed but more importantly if we make it someone else's problem then maybe the product owners aren't really listening because it's someone else's problem so it's a bit of a double-edged sword in doing that which is kind of why we've sat on the fence if you like but it would be great, it would be great to see that. So, I mean, we, we know we have, um, we work with the MyGov people and, and you know, they have the misery wall of, of the things that people say about MyGov and they're not very complimentary, but the MyGov people must own that and they must do something about what, what people are saying about their product. So having that over there that's doing someone else's job kind of takes away the great deal of responsibility, but I still think it's great. I mean, and there are lots of applications and lots of applications from um, from a state level that would be ideal to do that kind of stuff. Mm. If you do one, please let us know. We've got uh, Heather over there. Just in the chat. 
question. Now I'm looking for some uh, questions from this side, which is the right hand side, my right hand side, dominating here. So just sit up there. Hi. Um, my question um, is around um, the operate, operate, well, I'm probably going to say it now, but how to operationalise the um, transform service. So I'm guessing that's the role of the service delivery manager. Um, but are there any lessons learned and challenges around operate, operationalisation of um, the product? Yeah, look, and that's a really good question. One of the things um, that we're seeing at federal government is um, even though the BTO works at a very fast pace, agencies don't, and agencies are still, you know, some agencies approach this and come with, you know, like I described before, the same old quote that was on yesterday. We have a project management methodology, we have a process for funding approval on that, and that's cast in stone. And so we're saying we want you to work in a different way, and we don't quite know how to start. So our words to agencies like that is say, just pick one project, one thing that you could do, one product that you want to tra tra transform, or one hypothesis, you know. Your staff know where the problems are. You only need to ask them. And once you ask them, you'll say, right, well, we know that that looks, that looks like a problem because we're getting all of this information about it. It's like horizon scanning, you know. We know that there's all this noise over here. And until you decide to say, right, let's set up a team to try this and actually try and understand what that problem is, you won't ever start. So that's what we say to agencies is, is, is keep working in the way that you're working, but just try working in this way. Establish a multidisciplinary team, apply the service standard and the principles, and give it a go and time box it to 20 weeks. And the minute you do that and people can see what, what occurs, then you get another one and another one and another one and it works like a domino. So that's what we say to agencies is just start there. And that's the kind of challenge that I put out to you this morning. You don't have to be in a delivery team or in a, in a team applying the service standard to start transforming. You can do that with the principles today in your own job. So, but having a team together, doing a few little pilot projects and stuff like that is exactly the way that you start. And you need to um, share what you're doing. You need to be open about what you're doing. You all know the story about the General Electric. That's exactly what they did. Create people working in the middle in a fishbowl where everybody could see what they were doing. They were working and having fun and creating great things. And everybody was just a little bit curious about what are they doing and why. And when you do showcases, when you work in this way every week, you showcase your work to someone else. And they go, wow, that's amazing. And people see the transform transformation really quickly and then you get another product and another product. And then hopefully, within no time, your seniors are saying, we have to work in this way. Just one more very short one, hopefully. Um, you've mentioned um, developing um, common platforms for mm -hmm. common functionality. Um, I guess, um, how does this relate, and this is a question from Aaron as well, I guess, um, to the, the um, the cloud first policy. Like, the implication is build, 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 but we're also being told to look to the cloud for software as a service and other more efficient ways of delivery. So how does it all fit? So all the things that we're doing in the in the DTO are cloud based. So everything, all the all applications and things are all going are all hosted on our own cloud. So we're providing that platform for whatever agencies want to do. That's where it's held. So I guess that's effectively what we've got a couple of days. It's still very early days for us in terms of our first. Um, but one of the so we've got a couple of capabilities that were built into our our first policy. Uh, one is that every agency that uh, chooses to use a, a, a source a cloud based service has to tell us about it, and we maintain a central register that's available to all agencies called the Apps Catalog, which has it says it's six hundred different shareable applications or applications on there that uh, I think that uh, sort of to Jackie's idea, people should look at first before they go diving out to procure something directly from the market. So that's, that's one of the things that, that we're doing. Another is that we're building a series of case studies. So these aren't at the centre, these are out with agencies, and we're just in the process of uh, about to publish three of those to help agencies to get a better idea of the, how other agencies have successfully gone out uh, to uh, source cloud-based services. Um, and 
all the thinking that we've done. Um, and we've got a suite of seven different guides that are in various stages of sort of uh, alpha and beta development, which will be released in the sort of coming weeks. So how to think about the kind of financial implications, the network implications, um, some of the planning uh, around that, security records management, that sort of stuff. So we're working hard, and that's all based on clear signals that we're getting from agencies and sometimes from industry about what we need to put in place to help you guys. Because ultimately, that's the role we have as the, the government to help you guys transform the services. And cloud's one of those fundamental pillars of digital. All right. Yes. Thank you. Um, this, oh, this question is more from a uh, business unit perspective where we don't actually have a, an IT or a service design team, um, but we're just starting to work on a lot of business process improvement. We're also looking at organisational reform, and because we're a business unit within a department, I'm just curious to know who is it that's going to be doing all this amazing stuff, and where do we get one? <laughs> yeah, that is that is tricky. I mean, if you've had a look at the government's digital strategy, and I know it's <laughs> not entirely enamored with the digital strategy, but you could you could look at our digital strategy and it really reads like um, a series of choices to build the digital maturity of agencies, so to help you guys to build the maturity and send some clear signals about the new kinds of capabilities and methods that um, should be put in place if you're looking to transform 21st century digital services. And some of those groups are clearly borrowed from our friends in the Commonwealth Government and some we've um, developed on top of their services and some that we've actually built ourselves. But it's tricky. I mean, it's it's not a kind of stepwise change. It is really hard if you're, you know, if you've got a well managed, you know, Westminster system, um, everything's locked in, spec efficient, tied down, and you don't have kind of contingency for developing new capabilities. It's something which has got to be put in place. But you can't sort of plan your way through this sort of thing. And it's not something you can necessarily just do uh, in one agency, uh, sorry, that you can just apply across all agencies because every agency's digital maturity, if you like, or digital readiness is different. So, but I think the concept of having a go, um, building uh, like a, a minimum team um, in partnership with others maybe that have, have, have attained some success and done some shadowing and have a crack at something, <coughs> apply the standards and learn and talk to others, I think that's a really good starting point. Yeah, uh, look, uh, we, we, it's the same at federal level. Everybody wants one of those teams, but in fact, you, you're the team. You, you can create one. You should ask your, your seniors, why can't we do this? Let's apply the service standard. Let's have some multidisciplinary people, some multidisciplinary team in the work that you're doing now. You can, you can challenge and ask for that. Um, and you can apply the service standard to policy, and if you do, you won't hear about it. Absolutely are, and that's exactly why we developed the digital marketplace, and that's why the first thing on the digital marketplace is people. Because I, I'm not sure what happens to you in South Australia, but certainly in the Commonwealth government, it could take you know up to 12 weeks to get a person. We can be we can have designed a product within 12 weeks. So going through the digital marketplace, you can have a person within a couple of days. They're all pre-qualified. They're there. It's like a it's like an eBay for people. I need a person to come and do this who's highly experienced and qualified. That's exactly why we did the marketplace, and that's exactly why the first cab off the range in the marketplace is people. Do we have one here? We, we don't have the equivalent of that. We have a series of panels which typically just get us uh, more efficient access to more traditional foundational ICT skills and capabilities. Um, and we're, we're having a look at the um, digital marketplace at the moment, but we don't have the equivalent of yours right now. But I understand. You don't need one. Place. You can use ours. Yeah. Well, we have people from states already using our platform, already using the digital marketplace. Yeah. Um, just a comment on the teams um, aspect of it. So one of the programs, and as we know, we want to do more with less these days. And um, one of the programs that we actually run from the Office for Digital Government is about um, the user-centred design approach that you've outlined here today. And um, we work with. Um, 
the people affected by the problem and we present the societal problem that they have to our startup and entrepreneurial ecosystem here in South Australia to help us solve the problem. So it's a light touch involvement for agencies, but it's starting to um, showcase how you can actually um, work better with the people affected by the problem, bringing them together with those um, that are going to help possibly design the solution for that in, in that sort of um, fashion. So I'm happy to talk to anyone about that as well. Co-creation. We're doing a lot of that um, at federal level, you know, like with those Gulf Hack days, and we just did a tech hack now for refugees, dealing with people who are refugees, and, yeah, tech refugees and stuff like that. Um, it's very important to get in those things because they're gold. Gold comes out of some of those um, some of those co-design, co co-creation kind of sessions. They're fantastic. And we should, we should do more of that. I'm, quite, I'm pleased to hear that we're doing that kind of stuff. It is an entre entrepreneurial thing with, with businesses. Um, I just had a question with specific reference to the uh, tax regulation example that you gave. Um, how hard was it and, and perhaps how much pushback did you get finding a balance where the end language was acceptable lead to the legal experts and also to the tax office so they were comfortable with the simplified language still provided the legal clarity that they required? Mm -hmm. So that's why you have subject matter experts in the team because they were involved in developing that and accepted that in the team. It didn't have to go out to have 90 stamps from 90 other tax regulation lawyers. That person said, yep, that's satisfactory. And that decision, the decision that you get out of the end of that tool, holds up legally. That, that's why you have those people in the team, because you don't, it cuts down months of, you know, legality approval. I just want to change tack a bit. Going back to your citizenship, uh, Brooklyn defence, and so forth. Um, now it may be still on the agile development, but why do they still go through to have a ceremony rather than use the digital technology? For example, video the authorising federal officer swearing the the oath for Australia or more so, why they engage a local government minister to do such a, has that ever been questioned in that uh, project? I can't answer that, I don't, I don't know. It's not my product, I'm, I'm telling you about the, the, the transformation. So I don't know, um, they're actually transforming the booking system for the citizenship ceremony, whether or not the actual purpose of the ceremony has been um, discussed, I'm not sure. In fact, um, you know, as to what the legalities are around that cer ceremony, I'm not sure. What I can tell you is that uh, when we talk to unions, uh, people who want to become citizenships, the citizenship ceremony, the standing and swearing the oath, uh, was a very big thing in the patriotic process of becoming a citizen. So even though, you know, you, you might postulate that it might not be relevant, for, for some of our new group that we talked to, it was a very, that's the thing that they were aiming for, that actual, um, the physical presence of the ceremony and it being an occasion that marked a, a, a process in their life, in their context. So I don't know whether they looked at the legalities of why that even exists and tested that with users, but I know that the users that they spoke to, certainly the ones that I was privy to looking at the interviews, it was a very big thing. Yes, Back to again, you, you've gone through the user experience. That's part of the majority where they want to end up and so forth, rather than on a, uh, a policy basis. And that's just you know, so yeah, it's still communicated mm. with the user experience. Mm. I think when, when Monica came back and, and shared some of the stories of the exchange between them and the digital transformation that, that you mentioned before. One of the examples she uh, talked to us about was <clears throat> there was a, I think it's something to do with uh, the uh, birth of a child and that uh, it was sort of a two-stage process of sort of needing to register the birth in two separate places and um, through going through an empathetic discovery process, um, they, they thought in the outset it might actually need uh, an IT solution and in the end, um, they were able to completely get rid of that whole part of the process 
just by just getting, I think, the hospital to talk to the central one, yeah. rather than there being sort of two separate transactions with the customer. Yeah. So, so in some cases, I think there are, there are very precedents where taking the decentralized design approach might actually obviate the need for a bunch of touch points. Mm. Mm. And we should never assume that the way we deliver a product or service today is the optimum way because that's exactly right. In that particular Medicare enrollment thing, we actually took out processes only by mapping the service map, understanding the user journey, which no one had ever done from a service management perspective before, could we actually say, this is nonsense. We've got this department needing this, this department needing this, this department needing this. We get all that information here, let's cut out all those processes and get consent to share that information at the one point that it's given and that's exactly what we're doing. One, one more question. I'm conscious that we're eating into people's lunch times fairly soon, and that's a dangerous place for us to be. <laughs> okay, so just a couple of final reflections, if I may. Um, as I mentioned before, Office for Digital Government, uh, we're here to help. Um, we've got a bunch of tools and resources and, uh, that are available on digital.sa.gov.au. And um, if anyone wants that, I'm happy to send it out via an email or something afterwards if you don't already know about it. Um, there's a couple of things there that I wanted to point out in particular. One was the user-centered design toolkit, which uh, fits beautifully into the digital service standard. And um, I think we've got so Sonia over there. I think Monica might have ticked off, but Sonia's over there. So if you want to find out a little bit more about it, come and have a, chance, uh, come and have a chat with Sonia. Uh, and certainly come and talk to our office at, at any stage. And we're happy to come out and help you about how to apply that in, in your own contexts. Uh, I mentioned the Common Solutions Catalog, the Apps Catalog. Um, that's available off our, off our website as well, but you need to be a, a public servant <coughs> that is logged into Statenet to actually access it. So I'm not sure if there's uh, an outside here today. Um, we've also got the uh, cross-government group called the Digital Advice Group. Uh, it started off as a series of digital strategy practitioners, so those people that were responsible for developing the digital strategies and agencies. It's a commitment um, by the Premier. Um, and that's sort of slowly evolving now that most agencies have got their digital strategies done and out. It's evolving more into like an advice group, a sharing group that like a community of, um, I'm not sure I'd say expertise yet, because it's still really early on, but certainly a community of practice. And if anyone is interested in that, I think we're looking to open that up a bit more it's based on Basecamp, which is just an online place to, to talk and share. So I think we might actually move that if the numbers start to get a little bit bigger to that community. Okay. And lucky glass, um, in the cross-government digital action plans, this is the thing that the Cabinet committed us all to, there is an expectation that we have cracked at one exemplar service by the end of March 2017. Um, so uh, I would strongly encourage you to have a go at applying the digital service standard uh, to that first exemplar um, and then uh, talking to us about it and sharing with each other how that went because it's on the basis of the application of that that we're going to look to see whether or not there's anything that we feel that we need to do anything different here and maybe provide feedback to the Commonwealth Government uh, for its next round of changes to the standard. As uh, Jackie said, these things evolve on the basis of so that's it uh, from me uh, and us. Please ask the chairs together again. Thank you.